Francisco. It's the Good Time Show. And now your hosts, Artie and Sriram. Welcome to the Good Time Show. Let's get into it. I'm your host, Artie, and this is Sriram. And at the Good Time Show, we like to host conversations, optimistic conversations uh, with builders, with creators. And it can be in the topics of technology, um, sports, entertainment. We've had some really fantastic guests in the past. And uh, tonight is no exception. Tonight, Sriram, who do we have on the show? Well, uh, we have a very special guest uh, for a very special topic. Welcoming back to the show by popular demand. He is Mr. Current Thing. He is the master of Web 3, 5, I don't know what happened to Web 4, the one, the only, Mark Andreessen. Mark, come on up. Hey, folks. <laughs> if if oh, I look no. a little distracted, it's because um, we have new webcast soft, uh, we have streaming software this time. Um, and I, um, it's, um, I'm, I have so many uh, virtual backgrounds to choose from. Well, maybe a good place to start is we just go through some of your backgrounds. Like, could, could you explain the frame of mind that explains your current background right now, which for folks listening on audio is a brick wall? Well, let's see. No, that was just the default. <laughs> this, is, this is the one I was thinking. This is the one I was thinking of going with. Uh, uh, oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, well, you might go viral again on Twitter. This is my folder. This is my folder of backgrounds from when uh, we first all started using Zoom. There's just, there's a lot more. Let's see. Let's try. And when you, when you yeah, went there, live good. with somebody, oh, okay. Okay. There we go. I think that's no good. No words. I have Should no words. That? Yeah. This, yeah. I, yeah, we're all, we're off to a great start. We are okay. off to a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful start. Okay. Back to a brick wall. It is <laughs> up against the wall. It is. So, so what are we yes. going to talk about? Well, let's take some context here. Um, uh, this episode was sparked by a bunch of conversations that several of us, uh, you know, founders, friends of mine who work in the technology industry have been talking about. And, a hot topic. Yeah. And the way to describe it is for the past few years, mm -hmm. um, for those of us who work in technology, there's been something new which has been happening. Yep. Um, and the best way, to, and there are multiple words. Uh, some people call it employee activism. Mm. Some people call it politics in the yep. workplace. Yep. Uh, but what you've seen is whether it being people protesting, whether it being people hijacking internal channels or people writing internal letters. Uh, we've seen, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, Coinbase talk about being mission driven. Yeah. There's been this whole theme about politics and activism in the workplace, which honestly seems new. Yeah. And you know, if we were just having conversations about where does it all come from? How did this start? What do you do if you're a founder? What do you do for an employee? How to just make sense of it all? And, and then why now? Why now? And yeah. honestly, just what's going on. Just yep. what is going on. And uh, our guest today, Mark, has some very, very strong opinions on the topic. And Mark, I thought before we get into what is happening today, maybe we could start with how things used to be. So could you maybe, you know, and maybe we could start with a personal note because I know how much you love talking about your personal stories. Uh, you know, where you sort of founded most of the institutions you worked at, but were you ever a rebel? Was it ever a Mark writing an angry letter to the founder or CEO asking for something at the workplace in your 20s or 30s? Did that ever happen? No, I would just, I would have been writing the letter to myself. Yeah. <laughs> what, how much, how much fun would that be? You know, now, now that you mention it, I feel like I've been deprived. Everyone needs someone to complain I mean, to, you, right? You need to be a part of a, a Slack with a bunch of emojis. You can vote up, vote down. You can like, you can basically change the direction of the company. Mm. You've completely missed out on the opportunity. I, I've never even been in an ERG. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you definitely missed out because I enjoy when I'm grumpy about something, you know, sending you and Ben angry emails and notes. You definitely missed out. But maybe a good place to start is, you know, how did the workplace used to be in the 90s, right? You built Netscape. You actually spent some time at AOL. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, kind of a, a series of, uh, and then Love Cloud and then ACC. But how was the workplace? Because when I think workplaces, I think about my dad, um, you know, going to work nine to five, you know, with his briefcase, coming back home, um, very hierarchical structure. I think about Mad Men and Don Draper. So maybe one good place to start is, how were, how, how were things used to be? 
Yeah, well, I mean, look, in, in my in my kind of professional lifetime, and I think the lifetime of, you know, most of the people who would be, um, you know, kind of listening or watching this, um, you know, up until, I don't know, maybe, it's hard to say when it changed. The change kind of started a decade ago, but it really kicked in around 2015, 2016. We'll talk about it. It kind of traced back, I think, to 2012, 2011 in some ways. But like before that, and for sure before, you could say before the global financial crisis, basically the concept of politics in the workplace was basically a non-issue. Like it just, it, it, it didn't come up and it just, it just kind of assumed that people come to work, they work, they do their thing, they go home. Um, and, um, and then, you know, they engage in whatever level of politics or what, you know, whatever, whatever level, level of sort of moral issues, whatever, you know, religion they have, whatever social issues they're involved in, um, you know, they, they, they do that on their own time. And, and, you know, and, 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 you know, quite frankly, that was a sort of standard part of sort of the management playbook, right. Which is, you know, that, that, that is how you want things to be. And there was just a, a, you know, kind of a very basic reason for that, which is it's hard enough to run a company, you know, with everybody on the same page, um, you know, with everybody agreeing on everything. Like that's hard enough. Um, and so sort of management 101 just included what at the time was a very basic principle um, of, you know, if you basically if you basically allow divisions to form between employees and if you allow companies to polarize on political topics. Right. You'll, you'll inherently make the ma management mission worse. You'll 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 diminish the management capability of the company. You'll mm -hmm. decrease the risk of you know, the odds of success of the company. Um, and, and so that, 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 you know, an entire generation of managers was was, was trained basically on that. Now. You know, I think so. In some ways, I think the tech industry, um, and I'm going to say Google, but I think Google is just kind of one of many companies which kind of sparked this. You know, it felt like in the early 2000s there was this meme about, uh, hey, we're going to reject the stuffy ways of working in corporate America, yeah. um, and we're going to, you know, really embrace people uh, being more themselves, having more fun, and you know, I think a lot of people kind of just as you know, massages and you know, having tea in the workplace. But honestly, it was really about uh, replicating a more collegial academic atmosphere, at least that's kind of my positive take on it, uh, starting with, say, Google, but a bunch of other technology. I mean, uh, we kind of had that at Microsoft, too. Like, you know, I think you and I, when we started, we'd stay until, like, 2 or 3 in the morning. The, I remember being in, like, in, in India and Microsoft, like, playing cricket at, like, midnight. Uh, like, there was no home and work. It, it was all just, like, blended into one. And then, you know, we, you read articles about, like, Legos at work and all kinds of things where it just felt like this is a place you could like live, play and work. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things that happened. I think just to Artie's point, like one is I think there was, a, you know, the, the division between what your work identity was and what your home identity was yeah. started breaking down and you kind yep. of blended both. Yep. Uh, the second part of it was maybe a loosening up of how you behave, how you dress. You know, you no longer wear a suit. You don't know what what, what a tie yeah. to work. Uh, if you're maybe like a 2001 Google or a tech startup employee, those things started loosening up. And Mark, I think the reason you know at that time is interesting because at the time it felt like this was a huge positive. Like it was kind of a rejection of the old stuffy Don Draper Batman era. Um, and and you know, this is kind of the origin of the whole bring yourself to work. So I think you know, we, I want to get to how things went wrong. But do you think like the, was anything good about this moment? Yeah, well, look, so the, 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 the shift that you're talking about is, I think, a shift that actually sort of predated, you know, what you might consider to be, you know, sort of straight out of politics in the workplace. And so the shift you guys are describing, my, my interpretation of it is it started in the 1960s. And then, you know, the, the tech industry also, coincidentally, as we know it today, kind of also started in the 1960s. So it sort of started at the same time as the tech industry. And, you know, there's a famous American movie, The Graduate, um, which was sort of a movie that was a cultural turning point for this, yeah. where, um, you know, there's a point in the movie where uh, uh, for people who haven't seen the movie, I'm going to it's it's not a dramatic, it's not a thriller. So I'm not going to spoil anything that's going <laughs> to reduce your uh, your interest in the movie. But uh, there's a, a, a very poignant moment in the in the movie. This is a movie from about 50 years ago um, and when uh, Dustin Hoffman was was young. And uh, he plays a young uh, college graduate um, in the uh, in the movie, and he's at this. He's, he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life, um, and he's kind of having this sort of existential, you know, kind of crisis, as as a lot of people were kind of at, at that time in the late '60s, early '70s, in the culture. And so his, uh, you know, the whatever I forget, it was like the father of one of his friends, you know, takes them aside at this party, right? And the, the father's like one of these mad men, you know, he's in a suit and drinking, yeah. you know, <laughs> drinking whiskey um, at the party, and he takes him aside and says, you know, I, I have, you know, I just have one word of advice for you. Right. And, and that word of advice is plastics. Right. Yeah. And, and, the word, and the word of advice was basically go to work in the industrial plastics industry, like go, go, go to a big, you know, international conglomerate company and go to yeah. work in the plastics industry because plastics are the material of the future. And it was sort of representative of, you know, basically, you know, obviously not hard to uh, interpret the symbolism there of sort of society becoming plastic. 
Um, and so it was this thing. And of course, you know, this, this, this idea of going to work for whatever GE or whatever at that time and going into the plastics industry, you know, just horrified this character in the movie and sort of by extension, you know, kind of horrified a generation of, of, uh, you know, kind of hippies or counterculture types. And so, 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 so that was the origin of kind of the split that you're talking about. And, and actually Mad Men also, uh, the, the, the TV show Mad Men also uh, does a good job in this later seasons of mm -hmm. talking about the split. Um, and so then you sort of had this counter, you had this sort of fusion of sort of counterculture and business took place. It, it's actually interesting because it actually culminated in companies like Apple that were kind of, you know, basically, uh, you know, built on, on on basically infusing, you know, kind of you know business with counterculture, which which we could talk about. There was actually kind of a blending that took place. Um, as as, as left-wing critics would say, capitalism ate its ate its uh, its critique um, and, and figured out how to sell it back to us. And so companies kind of mm -hmm. became countercultural mm -hmm. in their way. Um, Martin Gurry, uh, who wrote the great book, uh, the the, the, uh, the revolt the of, of the public. The revolt of the public. Um, he 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 gives another example of the shift that you guys are talking about. He says you could you can see it in the names, right? Yeah. Like in the 40s, 50s, 60s, if you started a company, right, or worked for it was the International Business Machines Corporation, right? Mm -hmm. IBM, right? It was General Electric, right? It was General Motors. It was by the way General Dynamics, right? Which made like atomic weapons, right? All these companies had these incredibly formal, right? All it, the all you know United Fruit Company, yeah, which literally was like a the fruit company was literally literally called United Fruit Company. Like, yeah. Companies wanted to be sort of in the image of sort of like permanent, almost quasi-governmental institutions. And then you fast forward 30 years later and you've got Apple and, and Google and Yahoo, right? And, you know, um, you know, all, all, all these kind of, you know, it, you like, it's like the industry has been like on a search for like the silliest possible name. And a lot of that is sort of this counterculture rejection, right? Yep. It's, it's this counterculture thread that's, that's, that's been wired in. And so, Yep. And then, of course, along with that came, you know, came the, uh, you know, sort of relaxed dress code, right? Um, yeah. You know, the fact that we're not wearing, you know, literally blue suits, white shirts, red ties right now, right, uh, is a good, you know, is kind of a good example of that. So, so that, that stuff all happened between, call it 1965 and I would say 2010, and that kind of laid the groundwork for what we've seen, you know, over the, over the last decade. No, this other part, I think, of the 1960s on era that you talk about is, for example, my dad had worked in the exact same company from the time he graduated to the time he retired you know, had a pension. And I think that was common. And I know sometime recently I was looking at how people like IBM used to have company songs. Sometimes companies had uniforms. And your identity, your professional identity, you know, was really tied to one institution. And the idea was you kind of climb up the corporate ladder in this institution and go all the way up. And do you think there's maybe a shift in that where instead of, and it, honestly, when we started Microsoft, I'll never forget this. In our first year, we were kind of these 21 year old 20 year old, very impressionable kids. We had this very senior person, yeah. um, you know, show up and do a talk. And he said, well, all you young people, just so you know, um, it'll be five years before we take anything you do seriously at Microsoft, right? And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, right? I, 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 I remember being so struck by it. But also that. like you'd sit in reviews where somebody else like sitting next to you would have been there for 20, 25 years. And you're looking at them going, how could I ever possibly like match their experience and mm -hmm. knowledge and stuff? And, th and that was a norm. Yeah, that people. was very much the norm. And, yeah. uh, uh, and, uh, and, and I think and that was just in the tech industry, all this part of thing. And so, Mark, do you think something shifted there where people identified with one job, one company, climbed the corporate ladder to maybe something different in how they perceive their personal identity? Yeah, and in fact, there, there's a, uh, I, I, know I recommend too many books on these things. There's a famous book called The Organization Man, right, which, which, mm -hmm. which, which, which tells this story, sort of the, the, the classic on this topic. Um, yeah, and, 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 and let me actually adopt the, let me actually adopt a critique uh, of that, of, of sort of what happened there, um, right, which is basically, you alluded to this, but like these companies, a lot of these companies effectively promise lifetime employment. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to give you an example of that. So I was, my, my first actual job job, like, <laughs> of, of like in any sort of corporate environment, um, was at IBM. I was an intern at IBM when I was in college um, in 1989 and 1990. And I, I, I learned a lot there. And one of the things I learned was basically I, this, the, in the history of IBM, this is when IBM was at its largest, right? So IBM at the time was 440,000 employees. Uh, a few years earlier, the, 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 the stock price was starting to fall at that point. But a few years earlier, IBM was so dominant um, in the tech industry that, um, yeah, just one of these, thanks. Um, that um, it was actually 80% of the market cap of the entire tech industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, it, it was like a really big and important company at the time. It was a 70 year old company at that time. Um, it had never done a layoff. 
Wow. All right. So, so think of the idea of a company of that size and scale running for 70 years, never having done a layoff. And I was there when the first wave of layoffs started. And I can tell you like the shock that took place in the employee base of 440,000 yeah. people who, yeah. who, who, who really did believe that they had been promised lifetime employment, yep. um, like, you know, was really profound. And so, yeah, you, you could argue that there was, you know, there was a breach of trust that kind of promises were made that, that, that couldn't be delivered. Mm -hmm. You know, look, I think that's a valid critique. Um, I, I also think, look, circumstances change, times change. Um, I'll, I'll just give you my, my, my two big things that I, I think changed kind of in parallel with all this. Um, uh, it, so one is just like the, the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, where this model that we're talking about kind of got solidified, you know, was kind of this era that we sometimes call peak centralization. Our, our friend, biology friend of Austin kind of calls this peak centralization. And it's sort of when the technology and economics and media of the era of sort of the mid 20th century sort of optimized for the largest possible everything. Largest mm -hmm. possible countries, largest possible um, uh, companies, largest possible, you know, media outlets, um, uh, you know, just sort of this, this incredible centralization, you know, which, which, again, is why these companies wanted these names like General Motors, right? Like mm -hmm. there's, there's only one General Motors. There's only right? one, yeah. Right. Um, and so, you know, look, the peak centralization era lasted for a bit. And then economic changes and technological changes in the 70s and 80s, many of which came out of the tech industry, started to kind of dismantle that idea. A peak centralization, and that and that led to IBM's decline and fall, and that led to many other of these big companies unwinding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's one big change that happened. Um, and then, yeah, you know, to your to your earlier comment, the other big change that happened is, you know, society changed. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, kind of sociologists talk about a lot is, you know, people used to have, you know, all of these, you know, for better or for worse, they used to have these kind of very formal, fixed, you know, kind of bonds and groupings and relationships, you know, outside of the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the religion, right, and, and you know, church. Right. And community groups and, yep. um, you know, uh, all of these affinity clubs, yep. um, you know, these Elk, Elks Club and Rotary Club and Lions Club. And, 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 and so, people, and, you know, by the way, you know, it's, and everything else, sewing circles and right. And, you know, sports teams and like everything else that used to bond people. Um, and over the course of the last 50 years, you know, while, while we in theory have become sort of more socially liberal and socially enlightened, it, it is actually kind of weirdly ironic that the company and the workplace mm -hmm. have become more and more the center of our existence. And yeah. of course, you know, this is an issue that a lot of kids are dealing with right now, which is like, you know, the company campus environment of kind of pre-COVID is, it, you know, it's not the same now. And so there's this question we've talked about before, which is like, okay, what's, what's the experience for somebody young going to be? But, but to your point over the last 30 years, it's just, yeah, you, and, and this did culminate in Google. It's just culminated in this idea of like, no, you can actually get everything at work. Like you don't need social bonds outside of work. You don't need yeah. friends outside of work. Yeah. Right. You don't need a religion outside of work. Like we're going to give you everything. We're going to give you a value system. We're going to give you a platform for politics. We're going yeah. to give you everything in the workplace. And, and again, I would, I would kind of put that, you know, it was led by a different generation of managers, but I, I would kind of put that in, that in that same category. Like if IBM made a mistake promising its employees lifetime employment, I think maybe some of the current big companies have made a mistake promising their employees basically unlimited personal fulfillment in the workplace, which just fundamentally, like, I don't think the workplace can provide. So let's get to this. So the reason I want to kind of cover all this is because a lot of people, especially younger, may not be familiar with how the workplace used to be. But let's just get to today. Let's get to now. Now, in the last few years, we've seen, you know, off the top of my head, I can think of maybe four, five, you know, um, open letters, which, yeah. you know, where the usual pattern, there's an open letter from a bunch of anonymous employees, and they're trying to get some sort of, uh, quote unquote, social change done. Yeah. Uh, we've seen multiple protests. Uh, we, yeah. um, we have seen like internal uh, all hands or internal Slack, Microsoft Teams, whatever it may be, channels, uh, which have become um, more political. And I guess, you know, Let's just start with maybe a very dumb but basic question, Mark, which is, why is politics in the workplace bad? Oh, why is politics <laughs> in the workplace bad? Um, politics in the workplace is bad. Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and we can. I think we're going to go through the, 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 the short version, long version. I'll just give, give, give the short version. It, it is actually what, you know, I mentioned the previous generation of managers were trained. Um, which is it is so incredibly hard to get a business to work under the best of circumstances, right? It is so incredibly hard to get a team of people to come together, right, in a professional setting um, and be able to align on a goal um, and a mission um, and be able to have like an organized plan of action um, and then be able to execute against that plan. And then, by the way, have competition and then have to yeah. basically, you know, have to change the plan due to competition to be able to go through, you know, most companies go through crisis after crisis after crisis purely just in their business. 
Yeah. Right. And so to go through all that and to be, to be able to hold cohesion, you know, I use this term cohesion. There's, there's, there's a term in the military uses the ter this term unit cohesion, which gets to the same thing, which is like, you know, is a platoon under fire actually going to hold together or are people going to, are the soldiers going to like freak out and run? The yeah. um, there's one of my favorite uh, writers, Ibn Khaldun, uh, who's a famous uh, Islamic scholar of the rise and fall of, of empires. He, he always talked about his, his term was Asabaya, uh, which is a term you'll hear you sometime, which is basically this idea of kind of group cohesion. Group cohesion at a very deep level, right? Which is like, we're all in the same tribe. We're all in the same band, right? We're all in the same, like we all have, we're all rowing the boat in the same direction. Like we're really committed to the same thing. And like, we're going to help each other and reinforce each other. And we're going to trust each other, right? And we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to know that when we're not in the room, you know, our, our colleagues and partners are going to have our back and they're going to be, you know, they're going to be operating in a way that we know is, 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 uh, is in alignment with our own self-interest. We can trust leadership to do that. We can trust our colleagues to do that. We can trust that new hires are going to be brought up in a culture that's going to cause them to want to contribute to group cohesion. Um, like it's so hard to make a company work if you have group cohesion. Mm -hmm. Like to add another, to, to add basically anything to that that drives division uh, within the employee base is just, I mean, it's just flat out asking for trouble. Like, well, here, here's, a th here's, a funny th here's a funny thing that you'll, you'll see kind of people write about this or talk about this that kind of illustrates the nature of the problem, which is you'll, every time you'll see these studies and it'll be kind of like, okay, in the study will basically say the more successful the company, the more engaged it will be politically, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, and, and the suggestion often, and these are often these large, whatever, consulting organizations, business schools will kind of come out with these things. And it's like, they'll, what they'll do is they'll see a correlation between like success of company and like engagement in politics. And then they'll do what basically social science scientists do when they get sloppy and they'll, they'll basically allocate basically a, a causation, even when it's not necessarily there. And so they'll, they'll say, you know, higher success of company, you know, the, the political engagement must have caused the higher success of the company. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the counter argument, I think, is much more likely, right? The counter causation is much more likely, which is, right, success of company basically makes it <laughs> a successful company can tolerate more damage yes. um, caused by bad policies, such, such yeah. as getting more deeply involved in politics. Um, and so, you know, there are big companies that have such like amazing monopolies. They can, they can engage in unlimited politics, by the way, you know, Google maybe is one of these, like maybe the Google monopoly is just so strong that company can be engaged in politics for the rest of its life. And it won't matter. I can just tell you, and anybody who has been in a smaller company can tell you like in any normal company that doesn't like have an incredibly like rock solid monopoly. Mm -hmm. Like if you have anything that drives division in the employee base, like you are really asking for trouble. Yep. I think, uh, you know, I had a couple of follow on questions, but I think you answered like one of them. One is, uh, if this was really that terrible for the workplace, why do, especially smaller companies, why do they all continue to do this? Um, and, you know, it's like a lot of, you see this within workplaces, you see these like getting memos, getting leaked, you see employees seeking signatures, like whatever the form is, you're seeing a lot of this happen. Uh, so why, why, if it was like really that bad, why aren't like companies, founders stepping in and being like, nope, that's not acceptable. This is like going against our culture, which is like basically growth is the main thing that we want to go focus on. That's one. Two, um, I guess like, as you know, you see a lot of these happening. Do you have thoughts on like, you know, the intentions of these are like generally good. Like it's generally honorable intentions when they start, because you talked about SBA, you talked about like group cohesion in, in a way, this also brings up group cohesion in people like everyone, like a few people within the workplace supporting one particular cause, like the intentions are all, if it, it, like right now it's not great, but when they started out, it kind of seemed altruistic and like normal yeah. even. Right. It started Thoughts with the best that. of intent. Yeah. <laughs> right, of course. Yeah, so a couple of things. So one is, let, let me get, uh, give a, maybe a disclaimer up front on this, which is, um, you know, look, there there are lots of issues that arise in the workplace. Um, in some cases, those issues do involve, do, do end up with whistleblowing. Like, you know, they're, yeah. they're there is such a thing as like corporate malfeasance. There is such a thing as like when companies, for example, break a law. Yeah. Um, there is such a thing, you know, every every company of any size has some sort of formal whistleblower policy. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 you know, the press will be the first to tell you that a big part of their mission, you know, is to kind of surface, you know, a, a actual wrongdoing in companies or, or any organization. Um, yeah, and and, and it's very important to get a clarify yeah. because we're not talking about like financial, you know, crimes. Right. We're not talking about like, you know, workplace harassment. There's a lot of stuff which is like really, really bad. And I think this is not about that, right? This is about more political topics. This is about, you know, a lot of stuff that gets discussed on Twitter. This is somewhat very different class of issues. Yeah. So I just wanted to, I just want to make sure, yes, I agree with what you're saying. I just want to make sure nothing I say is attributed to like, I'm, you know, I'm anti whistleblowing or anything like that. Like that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking specifically about politics um, mm -hmm. in the workplace. So, so yeah, look on good intentions, like, look, <laughs> I mean, 
everybody's got good intentions. Like everybody's got good intentions all the time in my experience. Like somebody once said, like everybody's the hero of their own story, right? Like every, every individual main is character. walking, the main char every character, every, you know, every, I don't know if this is always the case. It's certainly the case since we've all grown up with TV and movies. Every single person you meet, right, is walking around with a narrative inside their head. Um, and it is like, I'm the main character in this story and I'm the protagonist and I am on the side of truth and goodness and light. Right. And I am going to take forward my, you know, my, the, you know, unfortunately the, the burden falls on me. I'm the only person in the world that has everything figured out. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm the, I'm the only person in the world that has a correct view of morality. It is my, you know, moral obligation to bring my morally correct views to the poor benighted world. Like everybody has that. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Like everybody's got the good intentions. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the, 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 the good intentions are there. And, 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 and this is, you know, and, and quite honestly, this is why, again, this is why you know, previous generations of companies had rules around this stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. if you tell everybody, it's, it's, this is part of the whole bring your whole self to work thing. If, you know, if part yeah. of that would be bring your good intentions to work. And it's like, well, the problem with good intentions is like, we don't all agree on these things, right? We, we don't all mm -hmm. have the same view. Uh, of how society should be ordered. We don't have all the same views of like basically how morality works. Like we, we just don't, and mm -hmm. we never have, and we're never going to, right? Mm -hmm. You know, short of some, you know, future Orwellian state where we all get like mind programmed by, you know, hacking into our, you know, mm -hmm. cerebral, you know, cerebral <laughs> cortex or something. Like we have different views on how society should be ordered. The process by which those views are argued, right? And decisions are made at a societal level, that process is politics. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and so exactly right. To your point, like th therein lies the conflict and it's a pre-built conflict. It's a very natural conflict in everybody's mind. Um, and, and, there, and therefore, like and, and therefore, therefore, as 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 leadership, you have two options. One is like you can indulge that and you can let it run out of control, which we'll talk about. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can say, look, that just is not what that's not going to happen here. So I'm going to make an assertion. I'm going to try and predict what you're going to respond to that assertion. And then I'm going to have an argument and we'll see how this goes. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, Mark, I see you're drinking. Today I came prepared. I opened this. I found a glass here. So, you know, if this show goes really well, you know, this will be consumed. But... Like how Sharam's like, I found a glass. Like, like it's like, how else are you going to drink it? Yeah. So... The bottle is now open. The glass yeah. has been identified, but there's been no liquid transferred from the bottle to the glass. But that's up to you. It depends on how much trouble you're going to get us in. Um. Okay. So <laughs> my assertion is one of my theories as to why companies like, you know, Google or some of these tech companies managed to beat the incumbents is they were able to harness the collective IQ of a set of individuals with an environment that maximize their creativity and these individual and one of the challenges is kind of this old school command and control hierarchical organizations is you are not able to harness the you know the collective output of a bunch of really smart somewhat counterculture rebellious you know don't really fit into you know ties and suits a bunch of engineers and um and a part of the trade-off was letting them act in ways that corporate america frowned upon and i would argue that that culture that bring your whole self to work was fundamental to how companies like Google and a lot of other companies in technology, I don't want to pick on Google, became the forces they are. Now, when I say this, I'm going to predict your response is going to be, well, how has it all worked out for you, right? Um, and <laughs> my response how, to your How's it going? How's it going, right? And do, you, my response, do, you, do you still like going to work? <laughs> well, my response to that response is, uh, I just want to make sure my Bayesian model of Mark's mm -hmm. responses is uh, spot on, which it seems to be it is. Um, my response to that is, is it just a question of, you know, a system which was good until, you know, I mean, these companies became, you know, these uh, dominant forces and, you know, they're built world-changing technology. It's just a question of just it having gone too far and just a question of rolling it back as opposed to, some people say what you might be exposing is a rollback to a earlier way of thinking, which may not be required. Well, okay. So the problem, the, the, the question as posed is actually quite easily falsified. Um, I've actually already falsified it uh, in a different way in this conversation, uh, which is IBM, which was the archetype, right, for the old model, right? To the, to the point, as you said, like they literally had corporate songbooks, right? They literally, and they literally had, the dress code literally was blue, shoot, blue, blue suit, white shirt, red tie for a very long time. And by the way, black shoes, no brown shoes, black shoes, to be very clear, shiny wow. black shoes. Brown shoes, like you might get sent home to change. <laughs> um, they were so successful in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that they got to the point where they were 80% of the market cap of the entire tech industry, hmm. right? And so, like, apparently, apparently, the model worked even better, right? And so, and again, this gets to this, like, difficulty of cause and effect, right? It, which is yeah. like, okay, did IBM get to where they got to? And did all of these other just amazing world-beating companies? I mean, you, you read the history of General Motors, 
you know, back in the 1920s, 1930s, you read the history of General Electric, you know, you read the history, I mean, you read the history of AT&T, how the telephone system got built out, by the way, the railroads in the 1800s, like these were world beating companies. I mean, these were mm -hmm. like, these were companies that were every bit as effective at both R&D and operations as, and, and everything else, you know, as any harnessing, you know, idiosyncratic engineers and all this stuff as any companies we have today. So I think causation here is very, very hard to establish. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think that's an argument to go back. Like, we don't go back. I don't think that's an argument to go back. I'm not proposing everybody put on the blue, the blue suit. I'm not proposing that we start singing the company songs, although the IBM hey, company maybe, songs. Maybe so, right? Maybe we need yeah, a song. The IBM company songs were excellent songs, and you can, I'm sure you can Google the uh, IBM songbook online. They're actually pretty catchy, them. honestly. Like, you know, they used to be, they, if you Google them, actually, you know, the IBM one, the Apple one, they're pretty catchy songs. Yeah, yeah. And so, look, uh, like, I, I think, I think your question is posed is 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 is, uh, is, is falsified. Uh, let me, however, concede your broader point. Um, your broader point is like, look, you, you don't want the goal is, not, and again, this goes with like not going back. The goal is not a corporate environment in which everybody walks in lockstep. Like that, that that's not the goal. Rigidity is not the goal. Like lack of flexibility, like you know, people being just you know kind of, you know, kind of uncomfortable in the workplace, being dissatisfied. Like th these things are not the goal. Um, and so, you know, 100%, there is a goal here of, you know, maximizing employee, uh, you know, productivity, maximizing employee satisfaction. You know, we could talk about all the different things that employees actually do find satisfying, as well as, you know, a lot of things that they don't. Uh, you know, being a great place to work, uh, being a place where you have like a lot of friends at work, a place where you like really respect your manager, and, you, you know, you really feel like your manager really looks out for you and is developing mm -hmm. you. And you feel like you're learning and growing. And, and by the way, within that, to your point, like you do want a certain level of anarchy, right? You do want a certain mm -hmm. level of experimentation. I'll give you I'll give you a funny historical example, though. I, even when IBM was at its most starch and rigid um, in the 50s and 60s, um, it had actually it had an outlet uh, that is actually a lot like what you're describing. And there was actually a term for it. Uh, they called them the wild ducks. Um, mm -hmm. And there were there were certain people at IBM in any given era who were basically allowed to break all the rules. Um, and they, they, they often are given the title IBM fellow, uh, but, it, but in some cases they weren't, but they were sort of identified by management as wild ducks. And the, the, the point of the term wild duck is, you know, the duck that doesn't fly, you know, with the flock, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's like off, off on its own. Um, and so even IBM at the peak of its rigidity always had kind of this outlet, you know, for basically a, a, sort, of, a sort of anarchic kind of freewheeling, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stuff. If, if Stephen were with us, he, he would say that, for example, the IBM PC project in Boca Raton in, 19, in, in the early 80s, <sighs> You know, mm -hmm. was an example of sort of such such a rogue thing. Like it was very non bureaucratic, and it was kind of allowed to go do its own thing. You know, so so I would say even the old you know kind of rigid companies got this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think you're right. There there there's a balance in here, but again, as we've been discussing, like the balance has to get to well functioning um, yeah. as as compared to let's say either overly rigid or overly anarchic. Yep. So mm -hmm. first, of all, by the way, Mark, maybe we should chat later about you know maybe our firm needs a firm song. Let's work on that separately. But uh, we're going to get to some practical questions about what CEOs and employees should do. But I want to ask you something theoretical, uh, which is over the last maybe 10 plus years, we've seen multiple tech companies um, try out holocracies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Zappos most famously, I think Asana tried a version. Um, but I think that people have always kind of, uh, um, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Gabe at Steam, um, you know, has tried out a version of this. Um, but I think there's always been this idea of, hey, something more egalitarian, something where we doesn't have formal command control, hierarchical structures seems a better way to operate. And I know you have theories about this and the iron law of <laughs> oligarchy, which sounds very <laughs> ominous. So could you talk to us about that? <laughs> yeah. So there's this kind of ideal, you know, it's kind of this, you know, we live in, a, in an egalitarian culture and we, you know, we have for a very long time, you know, it's kind of Western culture for the last couple thousand years has been egalitarian. Um, right. Um, and, um, you know, kind of basically what people do is they, they kind of say, well, okay, so therefore, like more egalitarianism is always better. You know, the more, the more egalitarian you can get, the better, the more everybody can kind of have an equal voice, the better, you know, therefore, therefore democracy and all, all these other kinds of, you know, core ideas, um, you know, in, in, in Western civilization, right, many, many of which have worked, worked very well. Um, and then you get to this kind of idea, well, we, we should basically only have democracy. Like we, we, we should, you know, and this is holacracy, like we, we should only have democracy. It should, it should truly be ruled by the, ruled by the many. The classic definition of of, um, of uh, democracy. We we shouldn't and we shouldn't compromise it. We shouldn't have managers, right? Um, you know. By, by, by the way, in politics, we call this direct democracy, right? Like um, you know, and 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 so the the political term is uh, plebiscites, right? Um, in a in a true democracy, you you don't have representatives, you don't have Congress people or senators or any of these things. You just have like the actual crowd voting on mm -hmm. each and every issue. Mm -hmm. um, we can have a long conversation about how well that's gone historically. The the short answer is it's it's been a disaster every time it's been tried. Uh, California, of course, runs in large part this way, which is why yeah. California is such a disaster in so many ways now. Um, and so there's the political version of it. And then, yeah, the corporate version is this idea of, of, of holacracy. 
Um, the best response is, is is in this iron law of oligarchy. But let me let me let me come come around to that. So there's this great essay written by the uh, uh, a prominent uh, feminist um, uh, political activist um, named uh, Joe Freeman, and her her essay is online. It's called the tyranny of structurelessness. Um, and it's, it's a spellbinding essay. It's one of the best things I've ever read. And it's, it's a story. And by the way, she, this is like purely from the far left. Like she is the furthest thing from like a right wing, whatever that you can possibly imagine. She's like full on, she was a primary activist in the sort of feminist, you know, political movement in the 1970s. You know, she, she literally was in, um, you know, feminist, uh, communes, uh, in the seventies, which were like, you know, again, it's sort of very, very far left, very anti-capitalist, very, very kind of everything you can imagine. Um, and she was in a sequence of environments, basically, in, in literally feminist communes, um, in, in which literally the, the goal was to get to complete democracy. The, the, the goal was to get to what, what, what is described these days as holacracy. Um, the title of her essay kind of gives away the point, which is, she says, the tyranny of structurelessness. Mm -hmm. and, and basically what she, what she goes through in the essay basically says, look, the, the problem with it is like, and again, you can form this, you can, you can word this formally, but the informal thing is, when you, when you have a large group of people trying to coordinate on something, you don't just get pure democracy. What you get basically is clicks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's, there's the thing. What, what you get is clicks. What you get basically is uh, groups forming to try to uh, exercise influence right over, over the whole. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically some group basically takes over. Um, and they rule on behalf of the group, but they rule on behalf of the group in an undefined and informal way. Yeah. And so, and, and, and so th therefore they do so in sort of the most m sort of, um, uh, manipulative, uh, deceitful, dishonest, right. Political way that you can imagine, right. There, yeah. There's no formalized way mm -hmm. for a representative government. And so therefore you back into basically this extremely perverse theory of, 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 of the political form that's known as oligarchy. Um, the iron law of oligarchy is the political science principle that kind of encapsulates this. The, the iron law of oligarchy is, is, is very straightforward, which is true democracy can't happen. Uh, mechanically. Uh, it can't happen mechanically because uh, a, lot, a large number of people cannot coordinate. They can't organize. Only small groups can organize. And so whenever you have a quote unquote democracy, whenever you have a large number of people who are supposed to coordinate, they don't coordinate. So what happens is a small number of people coordinate and they take power. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the U.S. founders saw this coming, you know, the U.S. famously as a representative democracy, not a true democracy, right? They designed Congress and the presidency to basically be the offsets to what would otherwise basically be the mob. Um, you know, in companies, we, we run an, an even more kind of hierarchical model. Generally, we run more like some sort of combination of a monarchy and an oligarchy. But we, you know, we definitely have a CEO and we definitely have a management team. You know, and again, a small number of people who run the larger number of people. Um, but anyway, the, the point is, if you don't define that, if, if you don't kind of understand that that's the natural outcome, and if you don't understand how horrible things go when something is just the mob mm -hmm. and the sort of perverse consequences of that, um, you can really uh, end up in trouble. And you, and you, and you and to, to, to Freeman's point, you end up in the worst form of trouble where you have an oligarchy running the thing, even when they're not supposed to. And, and things, things get really bad and really nasty. And so th those experiments just, mm -hmm. th they don't end well. And for anybody interested in this, it's worth going back and really understanding the, the, the political theory here, because this is not a new topic inside companies. This is something that basically political theorists mm -hmm. uh, for nation states have been thinking about for hundreds of years. And there's just a huge yeah. amount of data to support this, this conclusion. Um, I have a quote for you. And this comes from... I don't want to name this person, but uh, they run a very well-known uh, large company in the tech world. And this person sent me a quote which said, uh, people have already resigned and they aren't working for you anymore. They are now outrage entrepreneurs. Their product is producing outrage. Their market is your Slack. Their currency is Slack emojis. And I think, you know, I don't, I don't mean to pick on Slack because I think this is the same true for like Microsoft Teams or HipChat or, you know. It's, it's all tools. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's really any sort of modern communication collaborative tools. But how much do you think some of this is caused by this shift to away from, say, office memos to maybe email lists to now everyone's in a chat group? And I have another well-known founder who said uh, that one of the risks of being a CEO these days is you get addicted to the dopamine hit of emojis to your posts. And mm -hmm. he felt that, you know, it's even that it was a risk that a lot of people fall into. So how much do you think this is caused by modern collaboration tools? Yeah, so let me just say, first of all, um, to be clear, I think the primary problem is always the same. It's 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 problems with leadership. The the the, the, the pre whenever there's a crisis like this, the crisis is always leadership's fault. Um, and, and we can we can talk more about why why that's the case. Yeah, but it's it, yeah. it, it's basically it's it's always leadership's fault. It's leadership's fault way more than it's the employee's fault. It's leadership's fault even more than it's the fault of actually like malevolent employees. Mm -hmm. You know, which, which to your point earlier, like the actual malevolent employees are few and far between. Usually, even the sort of most strident activists think they're doing the right thing. 
um, in their own mind, at least they're not the villain. Um, yeah. And so I, I think in almost every case, what you're dealing with is a crisis of leadership, which I, which I think is, the, is sort of the, the, the broad based phenomenon that's been happening for sure for the last decade. Um, so mostly it's leadership. Um, you know, the other question you always ask about, like, did technology X cause result Y is you always ask, well, did result Y ever happen before, you know, technology X? And again, here you go back and it's, it's you know, it's not like activist movements are new, like with mm -hmm. the Internet. Right. Like there have yeah. been political activist yeah. movements for a very long time. Right. And in fact, it's not even new that there are political activist movements inside companies. There have been company revolts in the past. There have, I mean, look, for for many decades. Right. There were company revolts, you know, very enthusiastic company revolts that often ended in violence. Those were you know, called strikes. Um, right. And then there were unions formed to deal with it. Now, that, that was in an era where people were concerned primarily with economic issues as opposed to social issues. And so the yep. form of the unrest has changed. Um, right. But, the, you know, but the basic nature is the same. Like you, you had plenty of, 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 of union movements and strikes. Um, and, you know, even, you know, literally armed combat with management right before social media. Like you, you could even argue social media has actually caused things to become less violent. Um, like the, the, I've never heard the, that. I've never heard that argument before. Well, there was I mean, if you look at what happened in industrial strikes 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago, like they often got violent. Right. They often got physically violent, um, physical attacks. And like, you know, literally combat. Um, if you want to, uh, an amazing story would be the, 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 when the Washington Post had a big uh, printer strike. This was like 50 years ago. Like, if you look, look, look that up, um, you know, there were these incredibly like violent clashes between management and workers. Um, and so, you know, one, one sort of perverse theory would basically be that social media and all these social issues are sort of distracting, right? Are sort of taking people's mind off the things that would actually cause them to become violent. Maybe, maybe you know, there's, there's, there's more play acting going on now than it seems because it's sort of draining energy away from these sort of deeper issues where, where people would actually engage in violence in the past. Separate conversation we could have sometime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, having, said all, having said all that, um, if you couple weak leadership with modern communication tools, you have a witch's brew that can run completely out of control. Yeah. Um, yeah. and you know, I'll never say a bad thing about Slack cause we're very, you know, one of our investments, we're very proud of it. But like, if you let unfettered Slack or any collaboration tool, uh, or unfettered anything, I mean, look, email flame, you know, Stephen also here, if you he were here, he would point out email flame wars predated Slack. Mm -hmm. Um, if you let email run out of control, you know, coupled with bad leadership, um, yeah, then look, there's no question. Like you can feed, I don't know, you could say it's like, I don't know, pouring gas on the, on the fire or something like the, mm -hmm. the, the tools will give the consequences of bad leadership, a lot of ability to run. Mm -hmm. um, at scale um, in a way that is very hard to put back in the bottle. Um, when we announced we're doing the show today, um, you know, one of a founder of, let's just say, you know, kind of a mid-stage tech company, you know, said, kind of articulated what I think is a core conundrum a lot of founders say. I think because you use a phrase like strong and weak leadership, yeah. but I think for if you're a CEO, you almost have like two conflicting goals. On one hand, right, you just, you want to be somebody who's open to your employees you want to be open to input. You want them to have a voice. You want them to push back um, because you've grown up, you know, you know, really wanting that environment. You've enjoyed those environments. And, and generally, you're generally a nice person. You don't yeah, see yourself you, as like. Oh, hold you on, know. let me finish. Let me you finish. want to be liked. You want to be yeah, liked. No, no, no. I, I think no, I think that's a little bit. You want the gold. Thing. You want the gold star. You know, I think that's. I think that's a bit of an unfair characterization. I think it, you believe like having more people have a say and have voices leads to better outcomes, right? Like it could be Linus Torvalds, like, you know, all bugs, you know, um, you know, mul lots of eyes makes all bugs shallow. But you just believe like the more voice and opinions are heard, you know, the better the outcome. But on the other hand, you don't want riots, you know, you don't want your slack to be uh, taken over. But, and I but also you don't want to, you know, mo CEOs and most CEOs, I think, want to grow their business. They want to grow the company. Like that is the intention. Uh, so I don't think they see it as like this versus that. I just think some of them genuinely feel like I just want to be a decent person and do the right thing. Yeah. And yeah. I, that has nothing to do with growing the company. Yeah, and I think business. The, the, the way that I think a lot of this often plays out, having talked to a few of these folks is, you know, you want to create an open environment and maybe you have like a few people disagreeing in some small corner of some Slack channel. And you're like, you know, what, that's fine. That just break it. That's the cost of doing business because we have people being chime in. And then one day, you know, you have a takedown piece by some publication and you're like, how did we get here? So do, do you think this is a, do you think like, you know, when your founder thinks about this sort of choice, do you even think the choice is accurately portrayed? What do you tell them? Yeah, look, the, look, the big thing, the big thing is, do you want to win? Right. So the big thing is, do you want to win? Like, where do employees like to work? I'll tell you where employees like to work. They like to work at winning companies. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's what they like. Like, Find an employee base at a losing company that is like run in a super egalitarian open way with lots of like sharing and lots of like all the commune stuff, like, and ask people how much they like to work there. 
right? And what their, what their top level answer is going to be. And their top level answer is going to be like, I hate working here. It sucks. Like we're losing. Like that's the worst thing. By the way, I'm sorry. I'm getting some echo on the line. Uh, we seem to we seem to be okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll, let me try we'll that again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting a little bit of echo in the back. I'll turn. I'll turn down. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we are good here. We hear you okay. loud and clear. Yeah. Look. So so the high order th the higher order thing is winning, right? It, like yeah. if you win, you have like a lot of latitude to be able to design the culture. And this again goes back to the correlations. Like I go so far as to say, if you win, you can start to do all kinds of stuff that <laughs> companies that aren't winning can't do. You can start to indulge your stuff and all, all kind. You can start start to indulge your, yourself and your people and all kinds of stuff. You can have you know the kombucha bars and the masseuses and you know you can have political you know, political like you can have whatever you want. Like if you, if you if you win the way that Google has won and you have the search monopoly, like you can go crazy on all this stuff. And it, it, you know at some point maybe it doesn't. Maybe it matters. Maybe it doesn't whatever you can do that but like if the question is like are we going to win or not like then winning has to be the, the, the high priority thing and then and again let's go walk, walk down the logic chain which is like okay the most important thing is to win right mm -hmm. to win we need a high level of group cohesion now again group cohesion does not mean a dictatorship it doesn't mean that everybody just does what they're told right it doesn't mean and by the way even in the military the chain of command does not just mean everybody does what they're told they, they actually have a much more nuanced view on that which, which we could talk about called, called commander's intent but um group cohesion like everybody's running in the same direction everybody trusts each other that they have each other's interests at heart right everybody's on the same page everybody's executing against the same goal um, and so then the question is, is how to get is how to get to cohesion. And again, that's not you want like lockstep, right? But it's, it's the, that you want cohesion. There, there is a role in the process of establishing cohesion that involves consultation and listening and getting input. And for sure, like any good leader that wants cohesion does that. Because, by the way, if you don't do that, you're not going to have cohesion. Like if you're just giving orders, you're not going to have cohesion because people are just going to be resentful and they're going to think you're a dictator and they're not, the group's not going to cohere. Um, and so there, there's, there's, there, is, there, is, there is a lot of room in this model for um, lots of people making contributions. Um, but then decisions are going to get made. And then maybe let's talk for a minute about what it's actually like to be an employee at a company. Yeah, I think this is actually, this is actually what I was going to get to, which is core, like, because yeah. you've been talking about purely the founder yes. CEO perspective, but I think a lot of people here are not going to be founders, they're, they're going to be part of these institutions. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's a lot you can talk about, what, about what it's like to be an employee. Uh, the way we usually come at this, the short version basically is you can work backwards f to, as to why people quit, right? Because that's that's the ex the ultimate the ultimate uh, expression that I hate working here is I quit. Um, and so then you know if if you've you know probably like me, you've done a lot of exit exit interviews over the years, and basically what you find is there's there's basically well, well number one is I quit because this place isn't winning. Like the, you know this place sucks and it's not winning and it's it's losing and I got to go someplace that's going to win. So that's a big one. But let's assume that you're even on board with that. You get past that one. Um, um, the two big, the two, the, the the big things that come up in the exit interviews, it very rarely has to do with strategy. It very rarely has to do with the CEO doesn't listen to me. It very rarely has to do with I don't get to have my political views heard or any of these other issues. Um, it's basically um, a couple things. It's basically like some combination of I hate my manager and then I don't have any friends at work. Um, it, it's some combination of the two of those, right? Um, so I have a bad manager um, and, uh, you know, that sucks. Or like, I just, I don't have any, so, you know, to the point earlier in the conversation about social bonds, you know, I don't, I don't have, I, I don't have group cohesion at the, at the, at the sort of, um, you know, at the platoon level, as the military would say, kind of at the, at the, at the team level. Um, and so, so that's one. Um, and then the other is I feel like I'm not learning and growing. Right. Um, I feel like basically I'm not advancing. I'm not picking up new skills. I'm not being exposed to new experiences. Um, like those are the really big ones. Um, and so, again, it goes to like, OK, what is the company culture going to be like? Is it going to be a company? Go to that first one. Is it going to be a company culture that really values management? Right. And really trains its managers to do a great job. Is it going to be a company culture that really stresses cohesion so that people can actually be like trusting and have like close relationships with people at work as opposed to like distrustful and hate? Right. And then the learning and growing thing is like, do, does it prioritize the development of the employee base? Like, is it is it professional about how it goes about helping people succeed in their careers? Right. Which is which, again, is a very old school topic. It's like the opposite of the bring your whole self to work thing. It's like, well, I, like I'm not going to make you the perfect human. You know, the promise from the manager. I'm not going to make you a happy human being. I'm not going to like find you. A I'm not. There's a lot of things I'm not going to do for you. But like, I'm going to help you succeed in your career, right? I'm going to help you like actually deliver in your career. I'm going to help you, you know, provide for your family. I'm going to help you, you know, basically be able to pay for your grand kids, kids' college educations. Like, you know, the this, this stuff that matters in your career. I'm going to help you know optimize optimize your result. Um, and these things again, these things basically they're not that difficult. They go back to basically professional management. And so, and then, and then, so to my view, the question on all this other stuff just has to be asked is like, is it helping accomplish these things or is it actually cutting against them? Um, do you think this 
this is works only in an American context. So do you think this is true globally? I think one of the questions was, you know, especially in a world where we have like distributed remote teams, uh, you know, maybe there are other cultures which can sort of handle more egalitarian or less egalitarian context. How does this work in a global distributed, especially remote uh, setting? So I'm not a specialist on you know the the global stuff. Um, what I hear from my friends who run global companies and run companies outside the U.S. is basically everything that we've been arguing about tonight. It's an American phenomenon, or let's let's say it's a sort of an English-speaking world phenomenon. You know, it's a sort of America, England, Canada, Australia kind of thing, Anglosphere, let's call it. Um, and then it is in other company cultures, kind of as a degree to which they are connected to the Anglosphere, like directly, right? Um, and so, for example, if you talk to a company that has like half its employee base in Europe and half its employee base in the U.S., basically what they'll tell you is we've become Americanized. Like basically we have American politics. We basically, and by the way, we have political fights inside our European operation that are basically about American politics, right? Wh which is a really bizarre thing, right? Because American politics don't necessarily travel well outside, you know, national politics don't necessarily travel well outside of the individual country. Um, and so I've heard from like a bunch of European CEOs that they have employee bases sitting around like arguing about American politics. And it's it's like it, you know the one one thing they know is like they can't do anything about American politics. Like they can't We're basically politics. importing our culture on a mass scale to every every country on the planet. Yeah, that's right. And then you know, look, it's it's threading its way. You know, and you you guys you guys you know you guys tell me you guys may may even talk to more people in this domain, but it's 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 threading its way into sort of you know more and more you know countries and cultures that are further and further away from the Anglosphere, um, and uh, you know into into the into the, into the developing world. And so I. Like left unchecked, all of these issues I think are going to basically spread, and I think over time many of these are going to become universal. I I don't know if that's what's going to happen, but you know there there are signs that that process is underway. So I guess uh, you know I think back to Lakshmi Ram's question on like I think you answered it kind of on a high level, but you're an employee. It's a you know Series B, C, D stage company, so mid sized kind of company. You come in, you obviously want the company to grow. Y you see a lot of activism at work. If you take sides, you you know if you don't take sides, then it's kind of a problem because you basically get ostracized. Uh, you you have your own coworkers who are like, wait, you don't support that? Like, why not? Like, are you are you in this or are you not? If you do take sides, you're just worried that the company is just like distracted and it's like losing focus. And honestly, you don't want to participate in this. Like, there's a re like you want to come to work, you want to work, you want to like, you know, like building things is a thing that gives you joy. This stuff is like fine, but it's not really what you want to do at work. So what what choice do you have as an employee? Like, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. So th again, this is the problem with bad, bad leadership. Like that, that's a perfect articulation, in my view, of basically what happens as a consequence of bad leadership. And it's exactly what you describe. And it, it's actually, as you describe it, you kind of have flashbacks to like the clickishness of high school or something, right? Yeah. Right. Which is just like, am I sitting at the right lunch table? Like, do I have the right friends? Am I supposed to be with the jocks or the nerds or the this or the that? And there's bullies and like, there's all this stuff happening, right? And there's, you know, people calling the principal on, you know, there's all this like weird, bizarre, like basically adolescent stuff, you know, kind of happening. And, you know, most people go through that in high school and then they're like, wow, that sucked. I'm so glad I'm an adult now and I don't have to deal with that. Right. And then they go to work for one of these companies and they're right back in high school. Right. And so it's it, it like that's all real. That is the dysfunction that happens. And it just to, to double down on what you said, like, yeah, look, I mean, it's the thing. Like, look, if you're like a politically energized person and you show up in a company and they're all about politics and there's like raging political debate on everything, like you're thrilled because it gives you a chance to self-actualize all these views that you have. And it's fantastic. And maybe it's even a way to gain power and get promoted. And, and it's just, it's all, you know, very exciting. Um, if, if you are a, just a straight, you know, up down the middle, like I'm an employee, I have career aspirations. I want to go to work. I want to be treated like a professional. I want to be in a productive workplace. I want the company to win. I want to be with colleagues that I trust. Um, I want to not, you know, have, I, I have enough stress and agitation in my life as it is. I mean, I watch the news at night. I get stressed and agitated. I don't want to talk about it all day at work. Um, and then by the way, like I want to be able to have like peer relationships with people that have different political views. And then to your point, like, I don't want to like sign up for programs. Like I, maybe I feel differently than, than the, the dominant kind of, you know, the click feels. Um, and you know, maybe I don't want to fight with them. Um, but maybe I also don't want to lie. Right. And, and now I'm in this box where I have to basically either get into a fight I don't want to be in, or I have to basically lie and not be true to myself. And so that's an, it's a perfect articulation of basically the, the degenerate basically behavior that happens at the working level. Once, once this process starts in my view, when an employee is having that experience, again, it, that is like, that is like weak leadership. Like that's just like a, just unconscionable level of bad leadership. And it is, it is, it is far too common right now to where I think workers are experiencing exactly that. Uh, one of the things that always strikes me about, all of these activist uh, press stories is 
the total number of people who are kind of quoted as part of a petition is so tiny. Like one of the mental uh, things I always do is I kind of divide the number of people who are, you know, supposedly part of some campaign by the total employee base of the company. And it's usually minuscule. It's usually less than 10. Less or, than or, or even worse, like it says, we don't know how many people have signed it. Yes, it's... It, <laughs> which is like, you know, probably, you know, it's a zero. zero or a very small number. Yeah. And I think there's something here about maybe the tyranny of the minority and how most people, I'm going to, you know, uh, mention one of your favorite books, Mark, which is, uh, uh, you know, a, a Private Truth, Public Lies, which yeah. is most people, you know, probably don't want to sign up for this agenda, but they also don't want to get in trouble. They just want to you know, put their heads down, write code, you know, have just like a regular day at the office. Um, and so a small set of people can essentially hijack the public narrative. So, so I, that kind of strikes me across a lot of these stories that we see. Yeah, so Václav Havel, you know, who was a famous uh, communist dissident at, in Czechoslovakia in the, in the 70s and 80s, and then actually became the, after the Berlin Wall fell, became the, uh, the prime minister of Czechoslovakia, he wrote a famous essay on this topic called The, 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 um, um, the Power of the Powerless. Um, and it was, it's all about this phenomenon, and, it, and it's all about that what, the, what under communism was the slogan, people of, uh, the workers of the world unite. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, he starts with the vignette, which is the, you know, the, the, grocer. the, corner gro uh, the grocer's window. Yeah. The grocer's window. The grocer shows up every morning, and the first thing the grocer does when he's opening his store on the corner uh, in Prague is he puts a sign on the window that says workers of the world unite. Right. And he, and he basically goes through and it's it's a it's an incredible essay. He basically goes through layer by layer by layer by layer. You tweet like, on the whole thing, too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Of like, why is that slogan in the window? By the way, you know, this is like he points out, this is like in whatever year 70 of communism, like nobody believed in by like the 1970s, that the workers of the world are going to unite. Like it just it was obvious that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Um, right. Um, and so, but he's basically like, why is everybody putting this sign up? Why does everybody pretend that this is something that's normal? Why does everybody walking by the store not, you know, by the stop and stare that the sign is out? What are the consequences of not having the sign out? Like, what, what does the sign actually mean? Right. Um, and, and then what is what is not putting the sign out? Like what what would be interpreted if he failed to put the sign out that morning? Right. And, and, and to your point on the the the, uh, the, the, the public truth, private lies, like it's it, it basically it's political compliance. Like the, the basic theme is political compliance. There, there's basically two ways that people are basically forced into, into line on politics. Mm -hmm. um, one is they are prevented from saying something that they believe. Right. So their, their ability to speak or express themselves is suppressed by, by fear of sanction or censure. Um, the other is they're forced to say something they don't believe, mm -hmm. right? They're forced to sign up for the cause or the slogan or whatever it is uh, for something that they don't agree with. Um, both of those are incredibly corrosive to the soul. Um, they are corrosive to the soul every time they happen in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a country um, and, and in a political environment. And they're incredibly corrosive. You know, obviously they're corrosive uh, inside the workplace. And you, you, see, you see that happening all over the place. Um, and to your point, like, you, it's not like you get an accurate count. And, and this is something that I think a lot of CEOs miss. It's not like you get an accurate count. It's not like you, because people are either being forced to not say what they believe or they're being forced to say things they don't believe. Mm -hmm. You don't have an accurate count of what people actually think, mm -hmm. right? You can't trust, right? The, the, the prime minister of Czechoslovakia in 1980 could not do a head count of the grocers in Czechoslovakia in 1980 and assess how many of them were happy under communism because they had the workers of the world unite sign up and up in the store window. Like it, it had nothing to do with anything. Like it was not reflective of what people actually thought one bit. You have no idea what your employees actually think. Like you have no idea how many of them are sitting there being like, I cannot believe I'm being forced to lie like this. And, and that's the level of internal corrosion that takes place and the degradation that takes place. And that leads to all the kind of rage, you know, mm -hmm. and fear and bitterness and, you know, anger and rancor and all the sort of, you know, really deep seated psychological kind of, you know, <laughs> it's just yeah. screwed up dynamics that we're seeing more and more in all these places. Um, and so th that's the problem is, and again, I go back to weak leadership. If weak leadership allows the workers of the, the power of the powerless dynamic, the mm -hmm. greengrocer dynamic to develop, uh, or the preference falsification uh, thing to develop, like yep. as a leader, you, you basically can't ever figure out what the truth is and your ability to ever get it back in the box and get it under control and mm -hmm. reestablish a professional environment. Like maybe you can do it if you do enough surgery, but like, it's going to be really, really hard. Mm. Um, you know, so, so Another well-known founder, when he was, you know, when he saw that you were going to come on the show today, you know, uh, you know, point out that you know, Mark is probably going to make this about a dichotomy between strong and weak leadership, right? And his theory is there are contexts and there are communities where you can't ignore, um, you know, having these mechanisms where you want to have a voice. Like, for example, um, the open source world, and to some extent, the crypto world, 
kind of comes from a very open egalitarian ethos you know where often decentralized decentralized in you know, a lot of communication if we kind of grew up in open source you know you, a lot of communication happen on open mailing lists and there are a lot of flame wars and it was not like linus starwells could essentially shut down every dissenting opinion um you know there was kind of a culture of debate there's a culture of like having loud Openness. vocal personalities yeah. and of course you also had these antibodies resistant mechanism where you could fork a project and the best projects wind up surviving so do you think like the strong weak leadership dichotomy how does it work in certain contexts where you do need to have a plurality of voices where the ethos that you inhabit demands that you give you know everyone maybe free of open chat channels <laughs> well i think actually i don't so to be clear i don't think free and open chat channels are the problem um i i think that there are very well run companies that don't have these problems that have free and open chat channels i don't i don't think it's communication per se that's the problem I, again i think it's it's leadership but I, i made that point already um let me quibble let me quibble with your history um so <laughs> uh, look i came up no, no, no misinformation on the show mark i i do not allow misinformation on the yes um uh <laughs> we have a strict ban on misinformation consistent with the youtube uh, uh, uh terms of service yep Every everything on this show if you're seeing the show on YouTube it's an endorsement by YouTube that everything on it is factually true because <laughs> because of their misinformation policy. I have Mark, actually wondered whether we will survive now on Mark, YouTube. I think we're going to get this information tag at the bottom saying little note little known fact reasons. but everything on YouTube has been fact checked um, and everything that we say has been certified as true. Oh, no. Please don't um, mention any recent pandemics by name because then I'm sure some algorithm will spin up and we'll get a big banner and get you know, you know shadow okay, banner. You already mentioned pandemic too uh, late. Oh goodness. Okay. Yeah, too late. <laughs> the bots are on it. So um so um so open source is actually you mentioned Linus Torvalds twice now and I'm so glad you did because he he was my example of how to falsify the uh, the, the 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 claim. So <laughs> Linus Torvalds is famously <laughs> What is Linus Torvalds? What is he famously? He's the benevolent dictator of Linux. BDFL Yeah, but but uh, um, uh, um, uh, a dictator life. for life. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and so open source. This is actually something the, the open source projects, the successful open source projects, actually experience the, the 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 what I mentioned earlier, the iron law of oligarchy. You know, one way or another, somebody actually ends up being in charge. And so the the best open source projects actually tend to have a they actually tend to be monarchies. They they tend to have a dictatorship. Mm-hmm. Now again, like the dictatorship is not just I issue orders and everybody follows, but there is a single point of decision making at the top. Um, and so open source tends to, tends to work ba- best that way. Um, the internet itself, right, which is sort of famously egalitarian early on, like anybody can plug into it, right, no commercial activity. Um, it, it was actually in political theory terms, it was actually an aristocracy. Um, uh, it would be, I think, be the, the closest thing, which is you, you had actually what was called the IETF at the time. Um, mm-hmm. And you had the leadership of the IETF. And they were famously, they were called the graybeards. They were the, the, the Unix hackers that had the, they had the steel glasses, the big glasses, and then they had the, the beards down to their navels. and there were the, there were these guys in, in that era who were so well respected they were so competent um, and so smart and their judgment was so good that they were respected by everybody involved in engineering the internet at that time mm-hmm. and so therefore they were basically in a position to effectively rule again not give issuing orders but they were in a decision to basically make, you know they were in a position to be able to make the decisions um mm-hmm. and and so actually you know once again kind of in, in that open source world in that internet world you kind of see this same thing where you either end up with basically a healthy form of monarchy or you know mm-hmm. aristocracy oligarchy or or you under you, you end up with a de- degenerate version to your question this is what i think web3 is going to have to figure out right yeah. so th- so the the full egalitarian vision of web3 right is pure democracy the pure democracies of web3 are going to have the same problems that every other pure democracy for the last you know 500 years has also had mm-hmm. um they're not going to end up as democracies they're going to end up as some combination of oligarchy aristocracy monarchy tyranny they're going to end up as something else Mm-hmm. um and the 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 process of learning that right and and getting there either in a good and productive and useful way um or in a sort of dysfunctional and bizarre and corrosive way um is going to be one of the big things that that, that whole world is going to have to go through yeah. or we we may need to wait for web 5 um and uh, uh, uh web, <laughs> web 5 will fix this uh, don't change your background um okay so i want to maybe you know one last thing before we wrap and um yeah, i'm going to quibble with you a little bit because i think one of the things you keep coming back to on this show is strong leadership good right? leadership good yeah. leadership right um and i think for a lot of founders they're going to listen to this they're going to look at this and going to be like well what does that mean like you know i have it up some little fight sparking off on a slack channel yeah. i have an all hands that i want to run and i'm getting a very rude question um they, they they're dealing in sort of very practical kind of the loops that a company runs on and they're trying to make a decision like do i shut this down now do i let this go So maybe and, if you, you, and also for different stages, right? If you're a seed stage, Series A stage founder, 
what does good leadership look like then? Like, can you do anything preventative uh, versus like a late stage or a public company? What happens yeah. there? So I'm obviously not going to ask you to describe what good leadership is. You know, at least we haven't had enough alcohol yet for you to do that. But, you know, if you had maybe a few sort of like Tactical guiding things. themes or tips for founders listening to this who thinking about this at top of mind, what would it be? And as practical as possible. Yeah. So look, the big thing I'd leave people with is this, this topic, this dynamic basically either is going to go and your company is going to go in an upward spiral, a virtuous feedback cycle or a downward spiral, a, 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 a vicious cycle. Um, the, the, the downward spiral we've talked about a bit. Let me just describe what, why, what happens, though. The downward spiral, basically, when leadership in a company loses the moral high ground, um, when leadership of the company, when the management of the company, the CEO, the founders are no longer the people who are basically saying, making the decision, again, and not without input, but making the decision, right, of like, here is who we are, here is what we stand for, here's what our values are, here's what our mission is, here are the kinds of things that we tolerate in the workplace, here are the kinds of things we don't tolerate in the workplace, mm -hmm. like, Either leadership sets that sets sets that pattern, makes those decisions, or the mob sets the, sets that pattern and makes makes the decisions. Like that's that's your choice. Like you do it, or the mob does it. The first time you let the mob do it, you embolden the mob, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, one of the things you'll notice inside all these environments, and again, this happens both inside companies, outside companies. This happens in organizations yeah. of any size. When the mob gets traction, when the mob smells blood, they keep coming, right? And so when they get to make decision one a certain way, right? And leadership, you know, capitulates and caves under pressure they're going to come back for more. And there is no end to how bad things can get. There, <laughs> one of my favorite expressions of Michael Eisner once said, you can always fall off the floor. Like things can always get worse. Like you can, there are always more issues. There are always more problems. There are always more things to get mad about. Um, and so what a lot of companies are experiencing right now is they're in this downward spiral, right? And you can, you can tell what happens, right? Which is they, they have the instincts that you described. They want everybody to get along. They want everybody to feel included. They want this, they want that. And they capitulate, they capitulate, and they capitulate four times, five times, six times. And what happens is the mob is stronger than ever, right? Because uh, because because now because now you're you're weak, and they they, they know that they know that they can take you. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the downward spiral. There is another spiral. It's the upward spiral, and the upward spiral is greater cohesion, greater trust, right? Greater sense of camaraderie, greater sense of trust and faith in management, greater sense of trust and faith in each other, higher and higher levels of adult behavior in the workplace. Like how about that? Like people act more responsible over time, not less responsible over time. How about this? You become a better and better place to work, right? You become a place where employees are developing their careers more and more. You, you're, you're developing a place where management is getting better and better all the time, right? And you're in an upward spiral to higher and higher levels, right, of, of, of capability and execution. And by the way, feeling and warmth, right, in the environment and trust mm -hmm. in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and and so, so, so that's the, ch like, that's the choice. The, to brand new companies, I think there's a very simple message, right? I have a very simple message for, for brand new companies, which is a lot of the companies of the last 20 years that have preceded you um, are, are in the downward spiral. Like the downward spiral is a big problem across a lot of the industry right now. Mm -hmm. There is a very, there is a lot of low hanging food on the ground right now, which is to basically not have your company be all screwed up mm -hmm. um, and to basically have a company that's in the upward spiral and not the downward spiral. Um, and so e each new entrepreneur has a choice on this. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really worth thinking about, like, it may be one of the more fundamental strategic advantages that you can have over the next decade is, look, I'm, I'm not going to go down the corrosive, toxic, destructive path. I'm going to, I'm going to go for the upward spiral, uh, and I'm going to be the place where people are actually going to want to work and, and they're going to actually find it fulfilling. Right. And, and then as a consequence, by the way, over time, I'm going to go siphon off all the actual good people, right. At all, at all the places that are spiraling. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I, yeah, I just, I think that, 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 that arbitrage opportunity has really opened up and, you know, to, to, to my enormous amazement, that opportunity seems to be getting bigger and bigger. So, I, you know, I think founders, at the very least, should, should think about taking advantage of that. You know, that's a great note. The upward spiral, more adulting. A feeling uh, of cohesion and warmth. You know, I think there's a there's this counter argument that comes to like, you know, what does good leadership look like? And it's like, oh, you know, uh, CEOs come off as like dictators and it sounds like a really cold, horrible place to work. But that doesn't have to be true. This can be a place with like incredible warmth people just getting along with each other, feeling professional, feeling like your career is like going somewhere. You're actually going to be financially secure at the end of this. Um, and I think those are all like good things to aspire to. Yeah. And if you get other, maybe you can get a massage or two or have some tea and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, trust me, I think that, you know, we used to bond over food in the workplace, but I think it's a great note to end <laughs> on Mark, which is better cohesion, the upward spiral uh, in the workplace and the opportunity created by that. Oh, <laughs> Confidence in management is a plus for employees, not a minus. Mm -hmm. awesome.
Confident. Employees yeah. want to be confident in management. They want strong leadership. Yeah. I, I like that. Um, and, and maybe the comeback of corporate songs, maybe not that. But no, I think, look, this is... Uh, Conference and management upper I think No, I think this is like overall, this is a really tricky topic. Not many people speaking out on this. You, Not many founders willing to talk about this openly. So when you see yeah. a memo um, like, you know, Brian Armstrong put out or Parma Lucky put out, it's the exception, not the norm. And uh, and it's really easy to look at this as like, um, you know, why are they like taking a stance here, like mission oriented, like there are lots of these like catchphrases around it. But I think overall, if you truly work for want to work for a play, place that, focuses on growth and focuses on your career mattering to something, then I think this is worth taking seriously. Yeah, when I think about Brian's memo, um, Brian was obviously on the show a couple of weeks ago with Mark and we talked about being mission driven. I think of this meme um, of, you know, this kind of like this armed person holding out their hands and taking bullets for somebody kind of like sleeping. And I think in some ways it kind of sets a tone <laughs> for uh, a lot of other founders to follow. You don't have a vocabulary at a framework being mission driven, utterly what it is. But Mark, this has been a blast. We covered everything from um, IBM and wearing suits. Maybe we should all wear suits. Maybe, you know, uh, we look good in suits. Uh, uh, <laughs> or, uh, 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 but it's been a blast. And, you know, and I know a lot of founders are, uh, this is top of mind for them. Yeah. They worry about it. They have, you know, I know you and I and a lot of others talk to people about very practical issues facing this, but they all sometimes worry to talk about this in public. And I know this is going to resonate with South South people. So once again, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. And yeah, this is a blast. Thank you so much. Good. Fantastic. See you guys soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. See you.